That's fine. That's fine. Hello, everybody. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we have a special guest today. Can you tell us who you are? Hello, uh, my name is Brother Lucas. I'm a member of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. We're in uh, the U.S. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're a religious order in the Episcopal Church, which is the, the Anglican Church in the United States. Excellent. Can you tell us a little bit more about the order itself? Yeah, so we were founded in England, in Oxford. And we were founded by a man named Richard Benson, who was a, a priest in the Church of England. And the idea was an attraction to the reestablishment of um, religious or monastic communities in uh, Anglicanism in, in the Church of England. Um, and so we were the first stable order of, of, of men. There were women's orders that preceded us, but we were the first men's order that had been kind of reestablished since uh, in the Middle Ages in, in England. And so we were founded in 1867. Um, we had three members at first and two were English and one was an American. So there was an, always a plan to come to the United States and, and establish a chapter here. And that happened about five years after our founding. Mm -hmm. And the founder, can you tell us a bit more about him, some of his writings, his, his views? Yeah, uh, so he was, I mentioned we were founded in Oxford. We were, um, he was very, very influenced by the Oxford movement, which was a movement within the Church of England to sort of recover some practices that had been discarded uh, during the Protestant Reformation. Um, and so Richard Benson, he was a student at Oxford before uh, becoming ordained. And so he'd been influenced by a lot of those thinkers. Um, and you know, his background was actually, he was raised, his mother in particular was very involved in an evangelical uh, part of the Church of England. So he had this personal kind of piety or you know, this, this strong sense of a personal relationship with God. And he, that was very influential for him in terms of the idea of devoting your life to prayer in the way that, that monks or religious orders often do. Um, he was very emphatic about baptism in particular. He was really, really um, in love with kind of what happens at baptism, sort of initiation into the church. And so he um, is really enthusiastic about baptizing people. Um, he, he did some stuff in London in particular early on in his priesthood where he uh, kind of led a movement of of people and sort of inspired a lot of people to get baptized by him specifically. Um, he was very fascinated with India, which was at the time under colonial rule uh, in Britain of Britain, and uh, he always wanted to go there. He finally was able to toward the end of his life, but it took many more decades than he had hoped. Um, and one of the reasons he wanted to go there was because he wanted to you know, preach there and, and spread the gospel there. Um, but he was very critical of some of the state-sponsored missionary movements that were happening uh, in, in India and other British colonial possessions. He, uh, he was generally quite critical of the state and um, the church's relationship to the state. He had a lot of negative words uh, to say about what he called a Christendom, and that is the sort of um, the the lands where Christianity was dominant and reigned. And his fascination with India, he, you know, he explicitly said he didn't want India to become a Christian country because he thought that the the linking of Christianity with power or, or domination in a particular society sort of robbed the church of what it needed, which was uh, an experience of um, weakness and standing out and providing something different from the surrounding culture rather than being the dominant culture. So that, that was pretty prominent in his views. Um, he was really committed to uh, just the, the need for prayer and the need for people to minister and, and minister to people who were not necessarily the run of the mill average churchgoers at the time. Mm -hmm. And his kind of views on the state and Christianity, do you think that 
is relevant to now because you know people will say well look at the really christian countries they seem to be having a lot of issues whether it's poverty violence so being a christian country isn't all that good yeah i mean it's it's meaningful for me uh, personally um but i think in the timeline of christianity in particularly in the roman empire Christian monasticism emerged right around the year 300, roughly, um, as a major force. And that was also right around the time when the emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. And suddenly Christianity went from being a persecuted religion to a, um, an accepted and shortly thereafter, like legally mandated religion in the Roman Empire. So it was this huge shift from one of persecution and weakness and needing to really sacrifice a lot to suddenly being socially advantageous and a lot of people argued that monasticism emerged you know be, becoming a monk going out away from society and really devoting yourself to a strict regimen of prayer and and service to others um emerged in sort of response to you know suddenly we're, we're not being persecuted we're not being um you know we're, we're not being exposed to weakness or vulnerability uh, because it's now kind of socially advantageous to be a Christian rather than difficult. And so there was a sort of desire to um, pursue some of that that early, not pursue persecution, but to pursue some of that that difficulty because there was a sense that it made the church kind of what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I think it, um, you know, it, Father Benson, our founder, he was not alone Um in his thoughts, particularly in, in the 1800s, there were a lot of writers seeing really what we would call like modern industrial capitalism and, and the sort of the shift to the modern era uh, that we, we kind of live in now um, and really seeing the flaws in those societies and the sort of contrasting that with the values that they argued Christianity holds, which uh, prioritizes the weak and the vulnerable, and um, ultimately, you know, up until the point of death, and and assures, you know, even in that extreme weakness, uh, God is present and will will bring one to life again. Um, so, Benson was not alone in that, and I think it it's meaningful to hear that word Christendom come up again and again, and in some of these writings from from that era, because that was the real title of like kind of encapsulated everything that they were arguing against the sort of hypocrisies of um, Christian states or societies um, that that adopted that name but didn't really care about the poor, didn't really care about the weak or the vulnerable, and and were very content to just kind of accumulate wealth or power or what have you. And and I think that remains true today. Mm -hmm. Is there a tension between sort of the monastery versions of Christianity and what you would find in general society today or, or not really? Um, because I've heard critiques about, you know, mainstream Christianity is watered down. If you ask too much from people, they're leaving. And then, of course, you've got the mm -hmm. monastery, which is a very kind of uh, more committed approach. You know, there there can be or there might be. Um, one of the things, and this goes back to Benson, he really emphasized that in founding this community, we were meant to be a society within the church, not apart from the church. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that has continued to be um, a meaningful part of our our life and our our values because we we want to work with the churches around us, which are not monasteries, and we want to kind of we want to live our lives and we want to minister and we want to do work and be a community that actually is meaningful and and can kind of provide or strengthen some of the ministry of other churches you know we don't want to be in conflict we want to be in in collaboration with people um so yeah i i think you can validly criticize um a lot of maybe individual churches or church institutions or what have you is you know you might be able to fairly levy the criticism of watered down or um whatever it is at at lots of churches but i i think the the point of our 
community was never to be sort of we are sort of shunning that and doing our own thing the point of our community was we're going to devote ourselves really uh tangibly and and consistently to this life and our hope in doing that is not just our own kind of benefit but the benefit of of the broader church and can you tell us more about your specific order like where you are like what life is like so day to day yeah, so we are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think I said that already. That That is right next to Boston, which is a much bigger city than Cambridge, um, on the east coast of the U.S. And uh, Cambridge is where, um, and Boston more generally, there are a lot of universities here. Cambridge is where Harvard is. Cambridge is where MIT is. Those are some of the two very famous kind of uh, prestigious schools in, in the U.S. here. Um, as I said, we were founded in Oxford in the UK, which is obviously a university town. Oxford University is very famous. And so choosing Boston in particular um, was geared in part toward our, our work with student populations. And we do that a lot. Um, we are about a five minute walk from Harvard's campus. Uh, so we have significant relationships with students and faculty at the schools. Um, we're in an urban environment, which is not necessarily what people think of when they think of a monastery. They might think of, you know, somewhere out, out in a, a more rural location. Um, and the fact that we're in a more urban environment and we're living around people, you know, we have people joining us for prayer um, throughout the day. We pray several uh, services each day and people join us. We keep our doors open so that people can join us. We have a kind of congregation that, that does pray with us quite a bit. Um, a significant thing that we do is we have a guest house where people stay with us on retreat. And so they'll stay maybe for a weekend or a whole week or something like that. And they just kind of live alongside us for that time. And, and it's something that a lot of people do sort of to recharge, refresh, kind of clarify things for themselves, kind of give themselves space and use that space deliberately for prayer or attuning themselves to what they think God might be calling them to. Um, yeah, I mentioned students, a significant aspect of my, my work personally is with students. We have a weekly student group that meets on Tuesday evenings um, and, and I'm the primary facilitator for that at the moment, although our jobs kind of constantly change in the monastery. so. I say that now, it might not be true next week. <laughs> um, yeah, so so we, we try to, we're kind of embedded in the local fabric here. Um, but we also, we travel, we um, go to different cathedrals or schools or seminaries or parish churches or whatever that we have connections with um, kind of all over the country and, and sometimes in other countries. And um, we, we do teaching and preaching and we meet with people one-on-one -on -one if they want to talk about some problems or some, some things they're working through. Uh, so that's kind of a broad scope of, of what we do. Yeah. With the students, and of course, you know, it varies depending on the student and what university you're at. Do you see just any sort of general trends that, that the student's version of Christianity is very different to that of the older people you work with or when you go out to the churches, the students sort of come at Christianity in general very differently because there's always talk about where young people are leaving the church. Mm. They've got different kind of views. Yeah, there are. Um, the Episcopal Church here in the US uh, fairly or not, is is kind of tagged as a quite liberal denomination um, regarding things like gender, uh, you know, ordaining women, that sort of thing, um, which is, uh, I mean, that's, there's lots of controversy there worldwide, let alone the US. Mm -hmm. um, but in part because of that, and in part because of a different emphasis on prayer, I, we sort of have two um, well, well, three flavors, I think, of people coming to us. There are people who are raised in this tradition. Um, the, and then there are converts. And those converts, I think, divide pretty evenly into two camps. One of them is coming from more, for lack of a better term, conservative denominations with different and, and you know, being motivated by some of those differences around maybe it's just politics in general, maybe it's gender stuff, whatever it is. Um, and wanting a 
you know, a, a genuine church experience, but not wanting to feel like they're they're leaving some of that behind uh, or, or have to conform to a particular like political ideology that they might, might not agree with. Um, and then the other flavor, I think is the term I used, uh, are people who didn't grow up with any religion, which is an increasing number of people um, in, in the US and in Australia as well. Uh, people who, who are sort of exploring and trying to figure out if religion makes sense at all to them, or if they're, you know, maybe they are, they do feel something spiritual, but they're trying to find a name for it or find a place for it. Um, so increasingly, uh, less, you know, fewer people raised in the tradition and more people who are either, are either coming from different Christian traditions for various reasons, um, or are coming from no religion at all. And, um, are, are really just trying to explore and, and see, you know, there's this very long standing tradition and communities around it. And it has a particular set of beliefs or values and, and I'm interested, but I don't know. So I want to explore. So that that's, that's, and students in particular, that age group and being in a, a learning environment, people are, it just, it, it just encourages people to ask lots of questions and, try to figure stuff out so that's that's quite fun for me to kind of accompany people with that aspect of their own journeys and you mentioned sort of learning environment if someone wants to learn more about say christianity in a more academic way what would you recommend you know i um there are a number of uh you know, I could just point to the Bible or something, but there are a number of commentaries on the Bible. It, it's it's a very big tradition. It's a very big text, so it can be a little bit hard to pick a specific thing. But there there are lots and lots of specific texts on. You know, if you're interested in um, different interpretations of the kind of creation stories in Genesis, which sometimes um, you know people try to reconcile that with the scientific worldview and, and that sort of thing. Or if you're interested in, uh, you know, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament has a lot of violence in it. There, there are lots of academic treatments of these topics that you could just find by Googling, but it can be a really big, um, really big tool to enter and it can and feel very uh, distressing or disconcerting to, to have such a vast, and a thing to try and explore and not necessarily have a direction in it. When I was first, you know, I kind of discovered this whole tradition in, when I was a university student. And um, when I was really exploring it, the, the thing that um, helped me was actually going to a church and talking with the, the priest who was there and I would meet with him maybe once every month or two. And I would usually leave with about four books after each meeting. And the idea being that I could go and talk about the things I was thinking about, the things I was curious about. And here's a person who has expertise and who can kind of point me in the right direction for my specific questions. So I would actually primarily recommend reaching out to someone, you know, who's in that tradition already, who, who can maybe point to some sources for whatever specific interests or questions you have. Mm -hmm. and, and you were mentioned, you mentioned uh, you had these questions. What are sort of the main questions you hear now? Is it still the kind of the really traditional ones? Why does bad things happen to good people? How do we know there's a God? You know, hasn't science wiped it out? That sort of thing. Yeah, there, there's, uh, I mean, those are the, <laughs> the standard questions that have been around for a while and, um, I don't think those are going away anytime soon. That's that's definitely a part of it. Um, there are increasing questions about, um, there's this term that's sometimes in use that you might be familiar with, post-Christian. You know, what are these traditionally Christian societies, cultures, when more and more people are not religious? Like, what what does that mean in terms of our broader kind of cultural identity? What does that mean in terms of our the language we use about morality or ethics? Um, and so there are a lot of questions about kind of trying to um, figure out how to do that. 
there are questions relatedly about, you know, our population trends are, are shifting toward Christianity eventually, you know, in my lifetime, likely being a minority religion in the United States. Uh, and I know trends in other English speaking countries are following pretty similar trend lines there. Um, so what does it mean to actually be a minority religion again? How do we do that? Um, particularly with students, you know, being a student can be a very transient experience. You might go to university and you're there for a few years and then you're going on to something else and that might involve moving away from home or, you know, moving to a different city or that sort of thing. And so a lot of people are just very concerned about how do we find real in-person community together? How do we, how do we build that and, and how can I participate in that? Uh, I think a lot of people in our very sort of digital and individual age uh, end up really longing for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, in the US in particular, and it has some parallels to uh, Australian history, which is um, being a kind of colonial country or, you know, settler country and, and really examining in particular the questions we see are religion's role in relating to the land and the indigenous people here and what do we do with that and, and how do we move forward in a way that has some moral integrity um, and there are some meaningful answers and there are, continue to be some struggles on that but those and, are some of with, the things that we encounter with that uh, what what are some of the good things um, that are being done say with native americans yeah, yeah. Um, one thing is actually <laughs> for those of us who are of European descent to actually, instead of asking ourselves, Ooh, what do we do or how we feel, how do we feel about this actually going to people of indigenous American descent and, and talking to them, um, some of whom are in our church, are in our, you know, denomination. And, and so actually elevating those voices. Um, some of it has to do with not necessarily the people, but the land and like, how do we actually cultivate a relationship with the land that is not exploitative um, and that is more, you know, sees it as something to be related to and worked with rather than um, just sort of dominated. Um, and I think there's a lot of promise there uh, in particular, I think people are really, I think people long for that generally, you know, wanting to be really connected to where they are, mm -hmm. um, and, and to feel like they actually belong where they are rather than just sort of occupying the space. Mm -hmm. So that's been a pretty big thing and, and help kind of facilitating, like, how do you, how do you relate to the land and the environment and the space? How do you care about it? How do you pray with it? Um, and there are different answers for different people and different personality types will resonate with, with different things, but actually kind of going out and um, being in the natural world is kind of a, a unifying factor there, which we're, uh, we're happy to help facilitate people mm -hmm. doing that. And as a sort of a Christian in America, there are things that, you confront that perhaps other countries don't confront as much, say, like I'm thinking gun violence and things like that. Is there, a, are there other issues that sort of quite unique American? I'm just curious how as, as Christians you respond to some of those mm. issues. Yeah, I mean, gun violence is one. Uh, it's an odd thing because the US is quite famous for gun violence, including very recently, a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. um, and yet here where we are, we live in the state with one of the strongest gun control laws in the country and uh, one of the lowest rates of gun violence in the country. And so there's a sort of like, it's happening where we are on a countrywide scale, but but where we are on a local scale, it's, it's not nearly as much of an issue. And so, but we have, we reach people all across the country, so we need to speak coherently about it. Um, and that can be challenging because we are speaking from our context and other people's contexts are quite different from ours sometimes. And so we need to be careful about the language we use that not that we need to not take stands on kind of moral or political issues, but rather we need to 
be able to talk to people and communicate to them and with them and um, actually make sure we're rooting our message in the kind of the faith that we share. Uh, I think more broadly, um, you know, the U.S. occupies a spot in kind of world politics, the world stage um, that is pretty, there's, a, I mean, the U.S. is a rather powerful country. And so there's even a, a broader kind of political message that we have to hone, like, how do we, how do we as Americans who can vote and be involved in politics, who can have a share of that power, how do we do that responsibly and in a way that is uh, consistent with our kind of Christian call, vocation to love others and to serve God and um, to not get caught up in kind of nationalism and, and that sort of pride that can come with it and, and to actually care about people uh, you know, use what power we might have for good, not just the good of our country, but the good of the world. Mm -hmm. And can you give us a bit more information about Harvard itself? So when you're, you know, walking around, for those that have never been there, like what what's the environment like? What are you seeing? Um, well, Harvard, is, you know, Harvard was founded in the 1600s, um, very early on. It was founded actually as a seminary uh, and then expanded to be be a whole lot of other things. <laughs> um, so Harvard is, is by American standards, very, very old. Um, and it's really kind of everywhere in the town of Cambridge, the, lots and lots of stuff is ultimately owned by or partially owned by Harvard. It's this very massive institution and many, many people's working lives and revolve around Harvard either directly or indirectly. So Harvard's kind of everywhere <laughs> um, in a lot of the housing and a lot of the, the property ownership, that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, in just in terms of physical environment, there, there's a lot of beauty in this town. It's it's very deliberately cultivated. Like it's an elite university. They, they have money and they try to do things that are appealing to people with it. Um, and a part of that is, uh, things that I think we can all get behind, you know, investing in parks and things like that. And some of that, uh, you know, there, there's some, there can be some real friction sometimes between the people who live here and the institution of Harvard. And sometimes the people who live here are students. And sometimes the people who live here, maybe they don't have any direct relationship, but, uh, you know, things like property values and, and how expensive uh, it might be to have a home here or to find uh, an apartment or something like that. Um, so there's Harvard's everywhere. And sometimes that creates a kind of unified experience, which is good. And sometimes it's uh, an experience which causes some friction between various aspects of the town. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And walking around, you say you're seeing beautiful buildings, what are we seeing in terms of the people that are there in, in, in terms of the, the activities? The um, the place? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's a river that runs right, um, right through Cambridge, a major river. So uh, things like sailing and rowing and, and those sorts of things, those are, those are quite big here. Um, and the monastery happens to be right on the river. So we, we see that a lot. Um, there are, this is a given Harvard sort of prestige, it attracts a lot of people from not just across the country, but across the world. And so there are pretty significant populations um, of uh, maybe they're immigrants and they've moved here permanently, or maybe they uh, are just here temporarily on a student visa or something like that. Um, but populations from all over the world, you can usually hear a non-English language being spoken if you go for a walk in Harvard Square at some point. Mm -hmm. And that leads to, you know, a variety of ethnic groups and restaurants and and things like that. It means it's pretty religiously diverse uh, and just culturally diverse. Um, and there there is a sort of mishmash of, again, by American standards, quite old and classic looking architecture and um, 
you know, prestigious universities often like to be on the cutting edge of things. And so there's a mishmash of very, very, very modern architecture along with very, very classic looking architecture, um, that sort of thing. Is that kind yeah. of answer? Yeah, no, that's, thank you for that. Now you mentioned before about the need to help sort of those in need and mm -hmm. those struggling, those on the margins. How do you do that or how do Christians do that? And, and how, how do you kind of res respond to people who are saying, well, look at the poverty, look at the suffering in the world and, you know, how many times can I pray for liberation from that? Yeah. Um, the you know, various brothers here in the monastery have different kind of outside ministries. There are brothers who work with prisoners. There are brothers who work with um, the homeless population and feeding, feeding the homeless here in Boston. Um, so brothers have kind of their fingers in various ministries that are, you know, have personal meaning to them um, in terms of working with, with people who, who need help. Um, it is also true that, you know, I mentioned our retreats that we have here, that people come on retreat, and it's often people who are sort of on the front lines of, of for lack of a better term, like helping professions, or, you know, people who really spend their day job is is to help people who are in kind of dire straits sometimes uh, and are are what we offer in retreat and that kind of silence and rest and, and opportunity for reflection it's often people in those roles who take advantage of that as a means of sort of restoration so that they can go out and continue doing that work um, I think churches religious, communities more broadly are, are actually really well suited to do something about these problems rather than individuals because these these church institutions or religious organizations more broadly um, they exist as communities already and I think communities can actually provide not not just individual help in the sense of I'm going to volunteer for x hours each week or something like that but can make Communal decisions can um, kind of concentrate funding or resources that can then be used to help for whatever problems are sort of on the, the heart and minds of the people in that community. Um, and can even be mobilized in a way that's political in terms, you know, some sometimes all of the charitable giving in the world is not gonna eradicate uh, homelessness, for example. Sometimes you need political solutions and po politics is kind of how communities make decisions together. And so for the, the religious communities that exist within a, a given local city or you know, community like that, um, they're actually really well suited to organize together and um, make change happen when changes need to happen in order to, to take care of the poor and the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and when it comes to illness, so that this sort of come up in, in, in my kind of uh, work, um, we get sick, people die. What have you found works or is there nothing that really works? It, it seems that no matter what decade it is, what faith you are, losing people is always painful and, and how do you, why do people suffer and how do you kind of um, navigate that? Yeah. Um... You know, we take life vows here in the monastery, which I, I took my life vows uh, in June of last year, uh, which means I and I had a kind of a moment where I freaked out a little bit where I was like, am I moving into the building where eventually I'm going to die? You know, that might be decades and decades from now or it might, uh, who knows, it could be tomorrow. I have no idea. But um, so for us here in the monastery, there is a really sober awareness that underlies it all that like we are living this life and the end result that we're all going to face at one point or another is going to be death you know it's sort of a nothing is more inclusive in terms of human experience than than birth and death that's that's what we all go through right um and for some people that experience could be a really peaceful fulfillment of their their life and the values that they hold.
for others, it may be a really painful and difficult experience. And th that can include the person who's dying as well as the person, the, the people around that person. Um, sometimes someone passes away and, and you may love them very dearly, but because of their suffering or, or whatever it is, you may think you may actually feel some relief. And so might they. Uh, other times it's going to be really painful and it's really dependent on on individual circumstances. We do see a lot of death in our work. People, um, I think death serves to really clarify people's values. And when they sort of face death, it's very difficult to kind of run away from their, their really core beliefs about the world, about who they are, about God, whatever it is. Uh, and um, people do come to us in that for, for that kind of clarity and, and helping kind of guide them in in that journey of discovering what what really matters to them mm -hmm. um so we see it a lot i i don't think there's one kind of foolproof way to not make it painful i think sometimes even if it is an experience of a lot of suffering you know suffering can be ultimately the experience we need to to grow and to um become who we really are and all of this is you know couched in the christian belief that death death is sort of the ultimate weakness of, I mean, that's what christ was called to on the cross and in that came the resurrection and so sort of this this ultimate letting go out of trust in god that 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 letting go will not be an experience of shame or loss but rather will be an experience of of abundance and life mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And with students, um, what, what are some of the issues uh, that, that come up? I mean, I suppose there's that universal experience of stress with exams and relationship breakups. Um, so what are some of the, the, the issues that come up and what do you say to them to, to, to help? Um, yeah, I mean, we people people come to us when they're stressed about exams and such like that you know it, it's um it can be a difficult thing uh one of the things that people that students in particular have signaled to us is um this is a place in this sort of university dominated town where they can engage in parts of themselves that aren't just the academic or the intellectual where they can kind of have a heart, where they can feel things, where they can, and that that's encouraged and accepted and rewarded in some way. Um, and they can do that with other people and not just alone and isolated. Uh, there, there are people who, um, you know, in, in their entire work lives or their entire uh, lives of study, um, the only thing they get asked about is, the intellectual side of things, which is great. I mean, I love learning, intellect is great. Um, but if that's all you're ever asked about, it can be quite kind of soul crushing. <laughs> uh, so that's a particular issue we face. Um, and relatedly, uh, Harvard being this prestigious university, it's a place where there's a lot of um, upward mobility, for lack of a better word. People are, are trying to climb the ladder socially. People are are trying to be impressive and get these impressive degrees and advance in their careers. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with advancing in your career or anything like that, or getting a degree. But people uh, say to us quite frequently how tiring it is to constantly feel like they need to impress or be impressive or justify while well, I'm studying this because it's going to lead to that because you know and I'm going to accomplish or achieve this sort of thing and, and this constant building up uh, uh, just to the people around them of like how impressive their achievements are, are going to be or are supposed to be people get really really tired and worn down by that um, because they're, they're just constantly trying to be impressive rather than being accepted for who they are and, and what gifts they already have. There, there's always a sort of, but what am I, what am I doing to advance myself? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a thing a lot of students bring to us. And what's your kind of response to someone who says, I feel this tremendous pressure to you know, be someone to finish, you know, uh, to achieve a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it can depend on their personal circumstances you know so there there are times when i might advise someone 
is this actually making you happy? Is it even feasible for you to step back and, and say, no, I'm not going to go down this path because I don't actually feel like I, I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to because of social pressures, but it's not what I wanted. It's not, it's not what's giving me life. So there are some instances when I've said that to people, others are in fields that they do genuinely love and they want to pursue. Um, but they still feel this, this, all this pressure. And so the encouragement there is to sort of say, well, how both now and ongoing in the future, how are you going to find um, sources of human interaction, sources of community and sources of your own sort of understanding of yourself that aren't so expectant of particular achievements and advancements? Mm -hmm. um, and for a lot of people, just coming to us is where they find that. And so then the question is, why? What are you actually finding here? And that's different for different people. And the question is also, so, you know, you're here doing a degree program for so many years. You may move away after that. How, how are you, what are you going to take with you internally? What are you learning here um, about human nature, about human community or whatever it is about your relationship with God and, and sort of the, the theology of the individual and the, the group that Christianity has, how are you going to take that with you and kind of weather these storms, even if you're no longer in this place where you come to the monastery? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's different for different people, but that, those are the sort of starting points. Thank you for that. My last question can you tell us about you specifically? What 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 does Brother Lucas watch on Netflix? Does Brother Lucas watch Netflix hobbies? Are you out sailing? What is Brother Lucas getting up to? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you asked a lot of questions about politics. I before I came to the monastery, I was a university student studying political science. I, I quite like politics. I follow it a lot. That's one kind of hobby I have or interest that I have. Um, I like. I have a couple of other creative um, hobbies like woodworking. I really enjoy that. Um, I like reading, which I think everybody at Harvard likes reading, so I'm not <laughs> an exception there. Um, I like learning. You know, you mentioned Netflix. I don't watch a ton of Netflix. Uh, I, I watch some things on YouTube, and I enjoy um, learning about things like history. I, I like learning about biology and sort of the... the history of life on earth. That's really um, interesting to me. And I like learning that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, the, uh, so kind of a, a weird mishmash of things and and uh, the brothers all have their own little hobbies and interests. That, so we, we all retain some individuality here, yeah. Indeed, excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and, and, and share with us uh, about your life and about the monastery and Harvard and really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been really great being with you and, and uh, love talking about this sort of stuff. So thank you for the opportunity.